Some of you may be aware that I was a personal friend. I hadn't known him very long, but was becoming a very good friend with Pistol Pete Maravich. I don't know if you all, especially the girls here, you may not know who Pistol Pete Maravich was, but uh, he was perhaps one of the top 10 NBA basketball players of all time. Some people would put him in the top five. Uh, he was uh, Showtime before Magic knew what Showtime was. I mean, Pistol Pete was an incredible basketball player when he was in the eighth grade. When he was in the freshman year, he was in the freshman year at LSU, Louisiana State University, he packed out the gymnasium. Everybody came to see him play, and then they went home. One of the most arrogant things, uh, audacious things I've ever done, I invited Pete Maravich to play basketball with me uh, <laughs> the morning before the interview. Seven o'clock in the morning, he came to the gymnasium where I played three times a week and played basketball with us. And uh, it was really fun, and nobody tried to be a big shot with him and everything, and he played about a third speed, you know, and, uh, and everything. And uh, we played about 45 minutes. And uh, we stopped, and the guys went to get a drink, and Pete and I stayed on the floor. And I walked up to him, and I said, Pete, you can't give up this game. You've loved it too much. And he said, you know, I have had such a good time today. I'm, I'm going to have to get back into just uh, pickup basketball, sandlot basketball, they call it. And I said, I know you haven't been feeling well. How do you feel today? And he said, you know, uh, two weeks ago, I couldn't have picked up a two-pound ball and gotten it over my shoulder. Because he said, well, it's just this tremendous pain. And he said, it's neuralgia or neuritis or something. They don't know what it is. I said, how are you feeling today? And he said, I feel really good. He turned to walk away from me, and I turned, and for some reason, I, I looked back at him. I mean, two seconds later, Pete Maravich went down. As, as we all know, as, bro as, as brothers in Christ and sisters, uh, there's just something about the Lord that gives you such a confidence and a boldness that He just seems to take care of everything. I was, uh, when I got in here today, I was picked up by Jimmy Walker. I'd never seen Jimmy. He and I, and I would like to thank he and the whole Walker family for inviting me here. It's a real pleasure to come here in Phoenix. I've been here since I, I uh, left, and, and uh, the last time I played a basketball game here, I think, was about oh, I don't know, uh, maybe 1979 or 80. But uh, it's just a real pleasure. We had many conversations on the phone about this particular event, and, and um, it was just a real pleasure for me to come out here. In fact, when he picked me up, uh, uh, he ran me all over the place, uh, meeting all kind of people, and I was a little bit confused. He asked me and, for you to spin it on your finger. Oh, he wants me to spin the ball on my finger. Well... <laughs> I should be able to do a couple things, I, as long as I don't fall in the pool here. Uh, I used to be able to spin the ball. I've let my fingernails grow, Glenn. This is the first time in my life since I was about a year now. But uh, uh, that's kind of tough to do. Thanks a lot, Jimmy. I really appreciate this, wherever you are. It's a real nice guy. Hey, thanks, Jimmy. Surprised you didn't want me to do it on the platform there. But uh, the lights are good in your face, too, when you try to do this. But uh, uh, I used to, uh, I used to be able to do all this kind of stuff, but like I said, I don't really do it anymore. I don't really. Thank you very much. Uh, I was sitting in my, uh, uh, home last week. Uh, my kids had just gone off to school and my wife had uh, taken off to run some errands. And I was sitting at the, it was about eight o'clock in the morning and I, I was sitting at my breakfast table and I was just uh, <clears throat> sort of in the spirit thinking about what I should uh, come out here and speak about and asking the Lord if he wanted anything special for me to share. And I, I started getting things from him that uh, really um, just gave me a, 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 a real heart feeling for 
for uh, and compassion for all the people that I've come across that don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. I never really noticed the hand of God that was over, over me, protecting me. Nor did I notice at the time that I got in a car drunk and was driving with a bunch of my friends. And as I was driving that car and hit a parked car going 50 miles an hour and literally got stuck in the, in the windshield of the glass and they had to beat the glass, the whole windshield out from, from me just to get me out of the car. And as I got out and walked around and nobody was hurt and neither was I, I never thought about how God overruled and kept Pete Maravich here. As I was walking in the back of the parking lot out toward a I saw a telephone booth where I was going to call a taxi to go to the Holiday Inn where I was staying. As I was walking out, I heard this guy came out and he yelled to me. And little did I know that another guy had gone around the other side. And they both had blackjacks, which I didn't know. And the guy, the whole story is that the guy just literally, they just hit me from behind and beat me up pretty good. As I laid there on that parking lot that night, that girl came up. And I was all blood. And she took a 25 automatic pistol and she put it in my mouth and cocked it. And she says, you're a dead man, Pistol Pete. How about that? And I remember laying there and from the depths of my heart, I said, yeah, kill me. Because then I'll have peace. But you know something? There's a God up there that overruled Satan that night too. He overruled him. And I know that. You know what they do in hell? I don't have much more. I'm sure some of you would like to get this over with, but there's going to be a lot of weeping in hell and there's going to be a lot of wailing. There's gnashing of teeth, probably because of anger or probably because of the fact they know they've been separated from God forever. There's isolation and there's spiritual blackness. There's no light in hell. Absolutely no light. There's been testimony of the fact of people that have died and come back. There's been testimony of the fact even non-religious scientists, Dr. Kuba Ross, who spent her last 25 years in death and dying, she was before a thousand scientists and doctors in Los Angeles not too long ago, and she got a standing ovation when she declared, there is life after death, I know it. And she's not even religious. Not only is there spiritual blackness, but there's two things here, here that won't be there, two things that we grasp onto here. You see, one of them's light. You see these lights? Light gives you mental stability. Nobody likes to be in the dark for a long period of time. And something to grab onto. Solid, solid things, material things. Well, hell's a bottomless pit. You don't grab anything there. And you know, you can spend 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 centuries in hell and never accomplish one thing there and know that you don't have one less second to spend there. And I'm telling you folks, I cry at night for people that I don't even know. I cry for my brother who's unsaved, but I pray for it constantly.